Thank you for joining us today to hear this life-changing message. We hope you and your family are blessed. If you enjoy, please like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Also, please consider becoming a supporter of the channel to help us continue going. Blessings. Isn't Jesus good to us? You folks are hardcore. This is amazing. I love it. There are not, it's not every church that can pull off a weekend like this with a Friday night service and a double session on Saturday and Sunday morning and Sunday night. And look at this crowd here on a Sunday night. You're a fantastic group of people. And uh, it's been such an honor and a privilege and a, and a downright joy to spend some time with you and pastor allowed me the the privilege of just teaching the word of God, which is my sweet spot. I love to do that. And uh, you're so receptive to the word of God. And uh, you're so enamored with the presence of God. And you just kind of wade in and worship. And I love that about you. And uh, it's it's an honor to be in your presence. Of course, it's an honor to be with the Hanthorns. And I love your pastor, his wife, and their girls. And I love your leadership. I got a little bit of time to spend with them uh, this weekend. And I, uh, I love their heart for the kingdom and their heart for you and their heart for this community. I told you on uh, Friday night, I, I'm a crier, not a town crier. That actually pays money. I'm just a crier. Uh, but I'm just so thankful for the presence of God that is in this room. And I do believe Jesus has a purpose for this service. And I believe he wants to help some people here in a very important and integral part of your spiritual life tonight. And I know it's Sunday night, and uh, but I'm just going to teach you the word of the Lord. And we're going to let Jesus uh, do what he wants to do. My goodness. I've never grown tired of his presence. Not going to. In whatever way you can, from the depths of your heart, could you honor the Lord right now with your worship? One more time. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, God. Thank you, Jesus. There's an old hymn that we used to sing when I was a boy that says, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word (laughs) Just to rest upon his promise just to know thus saith the Lord and another verse said I'm so glad I've learned to trust him precious Jesus Savior friend and I know that thou art with me will be with uh, me to thee 
like a big choir. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace uh, to trust. Would you do it just one more time? Like a big choir, all the parts sing. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust. That's beautiful. How I proved him or and oh, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace uh, to trust him more. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to do something practical. I want to give you a gift tonight, especially if you're relatively new to the Christian faith, you're new to CLC. Um, I want to give you a gift tonight. And if you've been around a long time, I still want to give you a gift because I've had a lot of conversations, maybe hundreds of conversations with saints and pastors and new believers and people that have been around church for a long time. And this keeps coming up and keeps coming back. And there's a lot of people that feel like they just, they don't do a good job with prayer. They know how to sing and worship and you know, all of that, but but they just feel deficient in their prayer life. And, and so uh, I want to take a load of condemnation off your shoulders, perhaps. I want to just kind of talk to you about prayer for a little bit tonight. And um, this actually was a series that we did at home. We spent seven weeks in this, but this is a smart congregation, so we're going to do it in one sermon. I'm going to talk to you about seven prayers, seven simple prayers that can change your life. Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. And it came to pass that as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, when he stopped, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Would you lift up your hands just one final time before we're seated and just fill this room with adoration and love and praise to the Lord Jesus. Use your voice to do that. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I worship you, Jesus. I thank you for this great church. Thank you for this great church. Oh, I worship you. His presence is so sweet, so beautiful, so powerful. It's just like a river, just an undercurrent somewhere, like a, like a riptide just pulling in the spirit. Anything can happen in this room tonight. Anything can happen here. You may be seated. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus' disciples come to him with an important request. They don't ask him, Lord, teach us how to pray. They say, teach us to pray. See, they weren't asking for a method or a prayer plan or a structure or a technique. They watched Jesus pray, and they wanted his motivation, his hunger, his thirst, his passion. That's what they were after. It wasn't teach us how to pray, give us a a little program that we can repeat. It was tell us how it is that you have such a relationship with the Heavenly Father. So in response to their question, Jesus taught what I would call a master class on prayer. It's what we now call the Lord's Prayer, and it may be the most quoted words in the history of the world. But Jesus was not just giving us a paragraph to be repeated 
or a pattern to be memorized. He was telling us and he was showing them on that day just how simple prayer can actually be. Brothers and sisters, whether you've been in this church for five days or 50 years, prayer is simply a conversation with God. That's all it is. Now, you have conversations all the time with people in this room, people in your family, friends at work, and in your neighborhood. And the most meaningful conversations that we have with the most meaningful people in our lives, they are, they're not structured and formal, and we don't have to plan them. They are informal. They're candid. They're totally transparent. They don't have a rigid structure. They don't have any agenda. And as a result, we don't have to plan those conversations. We just have those conversations. They are as natural as breathing. They are effortless. They are usually endless. We talk to our friends all the time. Sometimes they're even voiceless. We're just together, but we're not talking. Men do that easier than women, by the way. And that is how prayer should feel, brothers and sisters. It's not pressure. It's not performance. It's not planning or pretending or posturing. It's prayer. It's having a conversation with Jesus. Now, if you're um, a type A driven perfectionist like me, um, hmm. they say, you know, are you a recovering perfectionist? No. Why would you want to recover from perfect? That's crazy. (laughs) If you're like me, you think this, and you've thought this if you're like me at all. Well, God already knows what I need. He knows what I'm going to say, so what's the point of prayer? Oh, this is a spiritual group. None of you ever thought that. (laughs) Don't give me that excuse. Most of your friends, including people in this room, they already know how you feel. They already know what you think. They already know what you're going through. They already know every one of your jokes that you tell every couple of weeks. And yet you talk to them anyway and have the same conversations with them over and over and over again um, at, the, at the restaurant, on the phone, in the foyer. Um, you already have, you have those conversations over and over again. So don't give me that, that you don't talk to people that, you know, know what you're going to say. Especially if you have a spouse, don't give me that. They already know everything you're going to say. Some of them can finish your sentences. The conversation never ends with all those important people because you have a relationship with all of those important people. So if I could give you a gift tonight, I just want to try to show you in the Word of God that prayer can be seen as something simple. It's as natural as breathing. It's as easy as talking. Prayer is as wonderful as friendship. Prayer is as powerful as love. And sometimes, just like in your significant, meaningful relationships, prayer can be as emotional as an argument. Prayer can be as insistent as a debate. Prayer can be as joyful as shared laughter, and prayer can be as comforting as a hug. Prayer is amazing because the God you serve is amazing. So tonight, uh, and we'll go quite quickly because, again, this is a very smart congregation. Um, I want to boil prayer down into seven very simple, in fact, one-word prayers. And I want to combine a couple of things. In Matthew, in chapter 6, we have Matthew's record of the Lord's Prayer. But then in the Gospel of John, we have what the theologians call the I am statements of Jesus. So I want to put those together. The seven phrases of the Lord's Prayer and the seven I am statements of Jesus. And, and uh, I, I think it will be helpful to you. So let's start Matthew 6, verse 9. Uh, Jesus begins this prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven. And I want to twin that with his I am statement in John 14 and 6, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the very first prayer that we encounter is the heartfelt cry of a child to their father. And you don't get to the father except through Jesus. The very first prayer we encounter is a pretty simple one-word prayer. Somebody say, help. 
That's what children ask their parents for all the time. Help me, Daddy. Help me, Mommy. Prayer begins by knowing who to turn to. You can't get to the Father unless you know Jesus because that's who he is. Jesus said, he that hath seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. I am come in my Father's name. So if you want to get to God, you've got to go through Jesus. Now help is simply a confession of your need. And some people, they pride themselves on never asking for help. Can I just be honest with you? Beverly tells me never to say stupid in the pulpit, so that's a stupid way to go through life, okay? So just stop doing that. You weren't created to not need help. God created you to need to depend on him. And and so if it matters to you, it matters to God. He's ready to help you if you will call on him for help. The truth is, whether it's our relationship with God or our relationship with each other, it takes a whole lot more courage and strength to ask for help than it does to hide and pretend and deny. Asking for help is not weakness. That's strength. Asking for help shows how smart you are. Needing help is the way God created you. And one of the most used names for God in all of Scripture is my helper. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in time of trouble. So if you'll only pray it, the word help can actually change your life because God created you with a little defect. You are created to need to live in continual dependence on him. It may look like weakness to the world, but it's really strength. So look to God for help. It's a simple prayer to pray. It's an instinctive prayer to pray. Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. I'm not looking around down here. I'm looking to God for my help. I know what you think. But Pastor Raymond, it's my fault I'm in this trouble. It'd be one thing to ask God for help if it was some other kind of situation. But what you don't know is I made the wrong turn. I made the wrong decision. I took the little sojourn into sin. I took the vacation from God. And and it's my fault I got in this problem. But see, your past doesn't matter to God. Because he can forgive your past. He can turn your greatest mess into your greatest miracle. He can turn your greatest trial into your greatest testimony. I love this verse from the prophet Hosea 13 and 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. You messed it up. You made the mess. But God still said, but in me is thine help. So whatever you've done and wherever you've been and whatever you need, God invites you to come to his throne room for help. And the path To his throne is prayer. Hebrews 4, 16. You know this one. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So it's just a simple prayer. Very simple. But because it's a prayer to your Father, our Father which art in heaven, because it's a prayer to your Father, he cares about you and he loves you. And if you'll just ask him, He's waiting to help you. Somebody say help. Help. That's the most instinctive prayer you could possibly pray. Help God. Help me, Jesus. Some of you need to pray that prayer tonight. Because you've got a situation at home in your family, maybe with your children or grandchildren or siblings or parents. You've got a situation maybe with your spouse somewhere in your life. And you need God's help. He's waiting to hear you pray that prayer. You don't have to drum up enough good works to be worthy to pray that prayer. You can pray that prayer right now where you're sitting. You can pray that prayer without any lead up, without any warning. Just, you just say, help God. <laughs> Do you remember uh, the, the blind man in Scripture? Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. They tried to shut him up and quiet him down, and he just wouldn't stop praying. Help, Jesus. That's what he was saying. Somebody say help. Help. Here's another one, Matthew 6 and 9. The second phrase, hallowed be thy name. Now, I can guarantee you didn't use the word hallowed at the dinner table today. That's not a word we use much anymore. 
but it's an important word in Scripture. I want to twin that with Jesus' statement in John 10 and 9. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. To hallow something, that's an old English word, it means to consecrate or sanctify or treat it as holy or to revere it or be in awe of it or set it apart. See, that's what we were doing tonight with our worship. We're hallowing the name of God. We're setting it apart. We're admiring him and we're, we're, we're worshiping him and we're in awe of him in those moments. And when you hallow God's name, when you hallow the name Jesus, you do it by offering worship. And here's why. Jesus said, I am the door. Worship is the door to God's presence. That's why your pastors and your worship team, and, and by the way, they're phenomenal, aren't they? They're amazing. Uh, that's why they're always up here saying, let's lift our hands and let's lift our voices and let's worship and let's sing and let's clap our hands because they know something from Scripture that worship is the door into God's presence. And if you can get worship flowing in a service, that's the door that you walk through into the very presence of God. And the easiest most instinctive kind of worship is just a one-word prayer. Somebody say thanks. When you say thanks to God, that's the easiest kind of worship to offer. You don't need a theological degree to say thanks to God. You don't need it. It's an amazing thing to just walk into his presence and think back over the day or the week or the month or your life and just find something somewhere that rises to the surface of your memory and you just say, oh my Somebody say thanks. thanks. Psalm 100 verse 4, you know this one. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So saying thanks to God is like the key to the door. It's like the latch to the gate. It's the invitation into his courts. It's like the password to his presence for all you computer people. Saying thanks to God isn't some list that you recite. It's not an obligation that you have to fulfill. Saying thanks is an attitude of the heart that comes out of your words, comes out of your mouth, in your expression. It's demonstrated in your actions. Being thankful, brothers and sisters, is a lifestyle. And this lifestyle of thanks appears everywhere in the Bible. So I have to ask you, what about you? How often do you actually say thanks? And more importantly than that, how often do you actually feel thankful? There's a lot of people that are messed up and bitter about whatever's going on in their life right now. Have you ever thought of the blessings that you have simply because you live in the great nation of America? Have you ever thought about you have running water? Clean Drinkable, running water? Have you ever thought that you have electricity? Have you ever thought that you have freedom to worship? Over five billion people in this world do not have freedom to worship God like you worship God today. Have you ever thought for just a second, hey, I'm filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Over seven billion people on this planet don't know what that is. But you do. You're filled with God's Spirit. You have all kinds of reasons to be thankful. So our prayer of thanks is just trying to put in words what is actually beyond words. It's not so much about what you say or how you say it. It's about what you feel, and it just comes out of your mouth, and you say thank you. I wish somebody would think over the last week of your life and just let your mind go to some blessing that you've enjoyed and just lift up your voice and say, thank you, God. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my spouse. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for my health. Thank you, God, for everything you've given me. Colossians 3 and 17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here it is. Giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So Paul wrote and he said, whatever you're doing and whatever you're talking about and whatever you're feeling and whatever you're going through, just give thanks. And he said this in Thessalonians, 
in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Oh, Pastor Raymond, please help me. Please pray for me. I want to know the will of God. Good. There it is. Give thanks. That's the will of God for you. Give thanks. Don't get messed up. You know, there's a lot of people with destination disease. Have you seen them? That's a pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah, they got destination disease. If God will just give me that, if God will just bless me with that, if I can just have that, if I can just get there, if I can just get that position or that job, if I can just have that career, if I can just... You got destination disease, my friend. When I get there, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be blessed. Then I'll be thankful. No, you can be thankful right now. You say, but you don't know what I'm going through. Well, see, Paul didn't say give thanks for everything. He didn't say for everything give thanks. Nobody's going to give God thanks for a disease that's racking their body. But he didn't say give God thanks for everything. He said in everything. I've gone to the hospital to visit people that were dying with cancer. And it just is distressing to you because they're such a great person and a wonderful saint of God. And you're thinking, Jesus, why? But here they are. You go in to encourage them and they end up encouraging you because they're laying on that hospital bed with frail little arms lifted up while you pray. And it's just skin and bones. And they're saying, thank you, Jesus. Whew. In everything, give thanks. Hebrews 13, verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. What is the sacrifice of praise? That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You see, sometimes thanks feels like a celebration because you got a lot to say thanks for. But sometimes thanks feels like a sacrifice. Because right now, life's upside down, and you're battling off depression, and your body's going through sickness, and your family's going through turmoil. But that's when you give the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Here's what you do. You just offer God thanks with your mouth until your emotions catch up. Don't let your emotions lead you around by the nose. Your emotions are totally unreliable. Your emotions are about as dependable as your body's reaction to the too much pizza that you had last night at the restaurant. You don't know how that's going to affect you. And sometimes I'm convinced that people have weird dreams and emotional states because they just ate too much or they stayed up too late. Oh, no, this is spiritual church. I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> Offer the sacrifice of praise. What is it? It's giving thanks to God. It's the easiest, most instinctive way through the door into his presence to just say, thank you, Jesus. I don't know why I'm going through this. See, Job, oldest book in your Bible, Job. Job went through this horrible trial. You know about it. It goes on for chapters and chapters. And Job's got three friends that show up and then a fourth one. And the three friends are called Job's comforters. They show up. And it's nice that they showed up. And they just sit and stare at him for a week. Like, it's like, would you go home? Job's comforters. And when they finally do start talking, they tear him apart. They blame him. They say, you must have sin in your life. And, and you must be an unrighteous, unjust man. And, and finally, Job starts talking because he has to defend himself somehow. And um, God isn't talking at that moment. And his friends are talking too much. And so finally, Job says, he said, you know what? I can't tell you when I'm coming out of this trial, but I can tell you how I'm coming out of this trial. I'm not coming out bitter, and I'm not coming out backslid. When he has tried me, whenever God's done with this, I'm coming forth as gold. I'm coming out of this, and I'm going to have joy in my heart and thanks on my... I can't tell you when I'm coming out of this sickness, but I can tell you how I'm coming out. I can't tell you when I'm walking out of this dark night of the soul, but... Whenever it is that God lets me out of here, I can't tell you when it will be. I can tell you how it will be. I'm going to be in church with my hands lifted high, and I'm going to be saying thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for me. You brought me out. Ah. My, 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 my. Say thanks with your mouth until your feelings catch up, because saying thanks can change your life. Everybody say help. Everybody say thanks. thanks. 
Here's another one, Matthew 6 and 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I want to take that phrase of the Lord's Prayer and twin it with this statement of Jesus, an I am statement, John 8 and 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You see, the very presence of Jesus pierces the darkness and puts the devil to flight. Because the Jesus that you know and love and serve, he doesn't just have light, he is light. First John, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now we understand exactly why Jesus would say he is the light of the world. We get that. But Jesus is no longer here on earth in physical form. That's exactly why he has a church, brothers and sisters. Because the same Jesus who said, I am the light of the world, also said this, Matthew 5, 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And he said this, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You look around this beautiful campus that you have the privilege of coming to every week and worshiping God here. You walk around the rooms and the hallways and every light switch in this building will preach a sermon to you. Because if that little switch, whether it's metal or plastic, whether it's a slider, it doesn't matter. Every switch in this building preaches a sermon. If it's connected to the power then when you flip the switch, the light is going to overcome the darkness every time. It's inevitable. And brothers and sisters, church, you are that light switch. You don't have the power, but you're connected to the one who has the power. So it all comes down to one very simple one-word prayer. Somebody shout, yes. Yes. See, you're the switch that says Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What you're doing when you pray that is you're saying, yes, God, I read this promise in your word, but I don't see it in my home. So I'm going to say yes to your word, yes to your promise, yes to your power, yes to your spirit until I see that fulfilled in my life. Yes, yes, yes. That's what you're praying when you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And by the way, in the Greek language, those are imperative statements, meaning simply that it sounds like this in the Greek language. Come, kingdom of God. It's like a command. Be done, will of God. Jesus, I'm looking around and your will's done 100% of the time in heaven, but it's not being done 100% of the time where I live. So I'm just going to keep saying yes until what's being done in heaven is done in earth. This is a prayer of agreement with the previously existing promises and plans of heaven. It's simply saying yes. You don't have to strain yourself. You don't have to work it up. You are just saying yes. You don't have to provide the power because your God already has all power. You just have to be the switch that turns on the light in your life, in your home, in your family, in your neighborhood. Now, Paul, he's amazing. I told you this already. I love him because every once in a while, he just lets them have it. Oh, I like him. Paul had to deal with a misunderstanding between him and the Corinthians in the second letter that we have in the Bible. We call it 2 Corinthians. He'd written them an earlier letter. For all you smart people, that's 1 Corinthians. And his earlier letter was filled with all kinds of correction and discipline because this church had a bunch of problems. And no doubt that discipline and correction, a little bit of rebuke, it was hard to receive, but they were very comforted that at least Paul promised them that he was going to come pay them a visit and see them in person. But then his plans got changed. It wasn't his fault. I mean, this is a guy that you know, alternates between prison and being shipwrecked and beaten and pro- thrown in jail and let down over walls and left for dead. So it wasn't his fault, but his plans got changed through no fault of his own. And so now the rumor mill in Corinth is going around and around, and they're really gossiping about Paul. And they're saying, like, is Paul fickle? Did Paul write us off? 
Is Paul mad at us? Did Paul tell us, yes, he was coming when all the time he was lying to us and he really meant, no, he's not coming? And so Paul wades into that misunderstanding and he can't just let it go or let it rest. He's going to use it as a teaching moment. And he actually uses this horrible misunderstanding to teach them a profound, powerful principle. Uh, here it is. This is 2 Corinthians, the second letter he writes that we have record of, uh, chapter 1. And here's what he says. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use likeness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. There you got it, right? That's a 400-year-old King James tongue twister is what that is. Let me kind of interpret. Paul says to them, do you think I talk out of both sides of my mouth? Do you think I callously break my promises? Don't you know I would have been there if my circumstances had allowed? Because I try to be as true to my word as God is to his word. And then Paul moves to his punchline and his point. This is powerful. Verse 20. For all the promises of God in Jesus are yes and in him amen under the glory of God by us. Paul says, you don't understand. All the promises of God are yes in Jesus. Jesus is a yes and an exclamation mark to every one of God's promises. Now the Bible's massive. The Bible extends over hundreds of years. It's written by dozens of people. It's a powerful, beautiful, and eternal book. But it's so supernatural that you can walk back into the Old Testament and, and you can go back to the children of Israel and a character named Joshua. And you can pick up a promise that God gave to Joshua probably 4,000 years ago. You can grab that promise and you can pull it into your life and you can say, see, that's a promise to Joshua, but... All the promises of God in Jesus are yes. And so I'm going to say yes to that promise. So when God says to Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot treads, I'm going to give that to you. Well, I'm going to go home and I'm going to walk around my living room because I've got some people that aren't serving Jesus. And I'm going to claim that promise. I know it was written to Joshua. I know it's a few thousand years old. But you see, all the promises of God in Jesus are yes and in Jesus or amen. So I'm just going to be the light switch. You know, all you parents, you go around the house turning off light switches. Spiritually, you need to be the person that goes around the house turning on light switches. Yes to God's plan. Yes to God's will. Yes to God's promise. Yes to God's peace. Yes to God's joy. Yes, yes, yes. That's a prayer you can pray. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. I was in a conference the other day and somebody said they were listening to somebody and they got kind of a couple of metaphors mixed up. And they said, it's not rocket surgery. <laughs> I'm having way too much fun this weekend. So, so, so Paul says that all of the promises of God in Jesus are yes and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. See, the power's in him, but it involves us. You've got to say yes and turn on that switch. So you've got to learn to speak heaven's covenant. It's a beautiful way to pray. If you're new to this, it's a beautiful way to pray to get the word of God. Open it up, read a verse, maybe put your name in that verse and pray that verse. It's a beautiful, powerful way to pray. I recommend the book of Psalms. It was the prayer book and the hymn book of ancient Israel, and it's got every kind of prayer you'd ever need. I mean, it goes from, I, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. I'm so strong, and I'm feeling joyful today. It goes all the way from that to, God, break out the teeth of my enemy. It's, it's got everything you need. It's amazing. Um, but you need to get some prayers. You need to get some verses. 
You know, when, when Paul and Silas said to that Philippian jailer, thou shalt be saved and thy house. You need to get that verse and say, God, I know that was written about a Philippian jailer a couple thousand years ago, but I need that in my house. I say yes to that promise because all the promises of God in Jesus are yes to me. So thou shalt be saved. Well, thank you, I'm saved, Jesus, but and thy house. I still need that part, so I'm going to say yes to that until I see it happen. Oh, my. Somebody say help. Somebody say thanks. Somebody say yes. Mm, you're not going to like this next one. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. And, of course, we're going to twin that with this statement from Jesus in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now, ironically, Jesus makes that I am statement the day after he fed 5,000 people. And that 5,000 people, they all show up the next day looking for more, 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 more. And that's when Jesus ends the discussion by saying, I am the bread of life. I am everything you need. I am enough. And something similar happens in the Lord's Prayer when Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. He's reaching back to God's miraculous provision of manna in the wilderness. That's what he's referring to. See, back in the wilderness, when Israel was being led out of slavery, God sustained them on a daily basis by sending manna, bread for them. And he told Israel, if you gather more than you need, it's going to spoil. Now, manna was unique. God gave them everything they needed. Watch this. He gave them everything they needed, but he didn't give them everything they wanted. The menu was the same for 40 years. We'd like to go back and get some leeks and onions and garlic from, from Egypt and kind of add it to this like we're tired of manna. Uh, you, you know, in Hebrew, manna, it's, it's the word that they said when they first walked out of their tents on that very first morning. Manna, manna. You know what manna means? It, it means, what is it? And, you know, I've been married for um, a long time, and I think Beverly has served that a few times during our married life. <laughs> manna. I think she has. And she's not here to defend herself tonight, so... Here's what God was trying to teach them. Way back, in, this isn't New Testament, this is Old Testament, Deuteronomy 8 and 3. And God humbled you, Moses said, and he suffered you to hunger and he fed you with manna. Now what kind of a contrast is that? You were hungry, but you were being fed at the same time. See, you had everything you needed, you just didn't have everything you wanted. It was manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. And here's what God was trying to teach them way back in the Old Testament. That God might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. That's what God was trying to teach them. Even in the Old Testament, God is trying to teach his people, you need me more than you need stuff. If you're not obeying my commandments, no amount of possessions or positions will satisfy the hunger of your heart. Without me, you're always going to feel empty. Without me, you're always going to want more. But with me, you will always have enough. Somebody shout, enough. That's a prayer that can change your life. God, I'm blessed, I'm content, I'm happy. I don't have everything I want, but I've got everything I need. I have enough. Thank you, God, enough. You see, this is perhaps the most misunderstood and misapplied phrase in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread is not saying, God, give me what I want. You know, it's not like the little boy, the little Catholic boy, precious little Catholic boy. Uh, he wanted a new bike, and uh, so he didn't know how to get it, and he prayed for it, and it didn't show up. So he went into his mother's bedroom, and she had a little statuette of the Virgin Mary, and he took it, and he hid it under his bed. And he got down to pray that night, and he said, God, I have your mother. Mother. <laughs> 
I'm sorry. I don't know where that came from. It's just. <laughs> See, when you pray, give us this day our daily bread, you're not saying, God, give me everything I want. No, you're saying, God, you're everything I need. That's what you're praying. It's not saying, I want everything on my list. It's saying, Jesus, you're at the top of my list. You're the bread that came down from heaven. So today, give me more of you. Give me this day my daily bread. When you pray, give us this day our daily bread, it's not a demand for more. It's a declaration of enough. Because if that ever gets in your spirit, enough can be a prayer that will change your life. I don't have everything I want, but I have everything I need because I have you, Jesus, and you are enough. Enough can refocus every day. A prayer called enough can give you your joy back. A prayer called enough can give you your peace back. Enough is not a level you achieve. Enough is a statement of trust that you declare. Enough. 1 Timothy 6 and 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I know a lot of godly people that look like they were baptized in dill pickle juice because they've got godliness, but they don't have contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So you don't get to give us this day our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer until you've already prayed, hallowed be thy name. You shouldn't begin to pray for all you want until you've already taken time to acknowledge that God is all you need. Somebody say, enough. enough. He is enough. Let's move on. Um, so everybody say, help. Everybody say, thanks. That's a powerful prayer. Everybody say, yes. And everybody say, enough. The newest Christian can pray these prayers. The smallest child who can just speak and understand a little bit, they can, they can pray these prayers. Here's another one, Matthew 6, verse 12. If you didn't like the last one, you're definitely not going to like this one. Matthew 6 and 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I want to twin that, strangely enough, with John 15 and 1, where Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. You see, God does something in our lives that we would compare to a vineyard. We would say it's his pruning process. He sometimes cuts things off in our lives. His pruning process allows deadness and disease and damage to be removed from our lives. His pruning process increases our fruitfulness. It clears out debris that could clutter our relationship with God and with other people. Now, here's the problem. We always think we're losing something when God prunes our lives, but actually we're gaining something. We always think it's going to hurt us, but actually God intends to help us. So many people resist praying this one simple prayer that would allow God to do this great work in their heart because his pruning appears to take something from them when all the time he's really wanting to give you a better future. Now, this concept um, it's so important with God, but it's also important with other people in your life. Because whether relationship issues are major or minor, all too often the only fix for them is to pray or to say one simple word. And that word is sorry. Everyone say sorry. sorry. Now, in America, you say sorry. And in Canada, I say sorry. So, Sari is a dress that they wear in India, and you keep pronouncing it however you want. But I'm going to say sorry. So you forgive me for my Canadian ease. It's one thing to pray, I'm sorry to God. And he always responds by pruning sin from our lives. But see, this clause in the Lord's Prayer is unique. There's no other phrase like it. Because Jesus made what you pray to God conditional on what you say to others. When you choose to forgive others, then you can ask God to forgive you. Letting them go free allows you to go free. Only this phrase of the Lord's Prayer has a P.S. attached to it. Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, the two verses immediately after the Lord's Prayer, Jesus reaches back and he said, oh, by the way, guys, P.S., 
if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now the Greek word that is translated forgive, it means a release from some type of obligation. Most commonly, a financial obligation. Now you think about this. When Jesus talks about forgiveness in the Gospels, he never talks about how you feel. He always talks about something very concrete, very cut and dried. He always illustrates the concept of forgiveness with a parable like this. He tells it multiple times. Um, there's a king. He loans a servant a million dollars, and the servant squanders the money, comes back to the king and says, I lost the money, I wasted the money, I can't pay you back. And now what's supposed to happen? Because the king, he's the victim here. It is his money. He is the innocent party. He has a right to be repaid. The servant is the guilty party. He lost the money. He wasted and squandered the money. He has an obligation to repay. But here's the problem in Jesus' parable. That servant doesn't have nearly enough resources to pay his debt. And so every single time in Jesus' story, the king forgives the debt, tears up the bill, the obligation, and lets the servant walk out free. The king chooses to cover the loss himself and forgive the servant. Now think about this. That king could have made a trip every day down to the debtor's prison. He could have supervised punishment of that servant himself. He could have spent time every week devising all sorts of penalties or even torture just to make sure that that servant realized the full weight of his offense and suffered the full penalty for his wrong. That king could have paid a monthly visit to the royal treasure just to see if he'd by chance paid anything on his debt. That king could have published a decree throughout the whole kingdom to humiliate that servant and humiliate his family and humiliate everybody that he loved and let everybody know about the situation and how wrong the servant was. Because the king had all the power, after all, he was the king. And the servant had done wrong, after all, he wasted and squandered and lost the money. So the king would have been totally justified. And brothers and sisters, this is exactly where the rubber meets the road in our relationships. Think about this. Realistically, what alternative to forgiveness did the king actually have? He didn't have to release the servant. But would his imprisonment have resulted in even one dollar being returned to the royal treasury? No. So was there any advantage to be gained by demanding that the servant remain behind bars and, and, and be punished for the rest of his life? Absolutely not. Yeah, the king could have gone down every day, hit him again, beat him again, punish him again, torture him this week. But that king in Jesus' parable was smart enough to realize two things. Number one, I am holding in my hand an uncollectible debt. The servant has no resources to pay me back. No matter how angry I get, no matter how much I think about it, talk about it, no matter how much I try to act against that servant, I'm holding in my hand an uncollectible debt. That servant doesn't have enough resources to pay me back. So in my hand, I'm holding an uncollectible debt. It's impossible for me to get anything back. And that king was smart enough to realize something else. Not only am I holding in my hand an uncollectible debt, but I'm a king. I've got a kingdom to run here. What a foolish thing it would be for me to spend the rest of my life distracted by this situation. Now, that's quite a parable Jesus told. But he meant for you to understand something. Every one of us are going to have situations arise in our lives where we are much more concerned about someone's obligation to us than they are. And you can hold on to the offense. You can hold on to the wrong. You can hold on to that situation for years. But when you do, you become an emotional hostage to your offender. They did you wrong way back then, but because you're holding on to it and you won't let go of it and you won't forgive it, you're causing damage to yourself every single day. Forgiveness, you say, but if I forgive them, that frees them. No, 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 no. If you forgive them, that frees you. It doesn't just set them free, it sets you free. 
So the best reason to forgive is not what it does for them, it's what it does for you. Because two things, brothers and sisters, you're holding in your hand an uncollectible debt. (laughs) What good is going to be done by having one more conversation about it? One more argument about it? Talking to somebody else and dragging them into it? You're holding in your hand an uncollectible debt. Think, think, think. Realistically, what could they ever give that would make it right now? They hurt you. They talked about you. They gossiped about you. They ruined your reputation. They misused you. They abused you. It's horrible. I'm not saying it's not evil and wrong and wicked. I'm not saying that they weren't totally in the wrong. They were. Some of you bear the scars emotionally from things you've gone through some of years ago. But do you know, I know people that are still bitter and bent out of shape at somebody, and that person isn't even on this planet anymore. We already had their funeral. But they're tied up inside emotionally. And, and I've actually been in meetings where somebody on this side of the congregation, they, they, they watch somebody on that side of the congregation with eagle eyes because if they're lifting up their hand, they don't have a right to get a blessing. They don't have a right to worship God. Who do they think they are? If this congregation knew what they did to me, what they said about me. Unforgiveness is like a cancer that eats you alive spiritually. So Jesus taught us, you got to be smart enough to realize you're holding an uncollectible debt. So he never taught that forgiveness was anything to do with what you remember or forget. He never taught that forgiveness is anything to do with what you feel or don't feel. He always taught forgiveness is just a decision you make. That I'm going to tear up the debt and throw it away. And I'm going to walk on. Because I'm holding an uncollectible debt. But also, hey, I'm a child of the king. We've got a kingdom to build here. I've got better things to do with my life than be tied up and bitter and bent out of shape about what somebody said about me or did to me 25 years ago. If I could give you a gift tonight, I'd love to give somebody the gift of walking out of here free because you let go of something that's been bothering your spirit for years and years and years. You have a right to be free. You're a child of God. But I still remember it, Pastor Raymond. Forgiveness isn't forgetting. But but you don't understand. I still feel it. Forgiveness isn't about your emotions. Forgiveness is a decision that you make to say, you know what? I'm sorry that happened, but I'm going to live for God. I'm sorry that happened, but I'm going to have joy. I'm sorry that happened, but I'm going to get my peace back. My goodness. See, we think sorry is taking something from us when really it's giving something to us. It's God's pruning process to get rid of those things that are holding us back. Um, okay, so, so we need to move on. Somebody say help. Thanks. Anybody remember the next one? Good. I told you this was a smart crew, Pastor. Somebody say enough. And somebody say sorry. Mm-hmm, good. In Wisconsin. Here's another prayer. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's put that together with John 10 and verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, I have some bad news for you, wonderful people tonight. Um, Sheep are not survivors. Sheep are not strong or independent creatures. They are definitely not proud hunters or fierce predators. (laughs) You can take just about any other domesticated animal and return it to the wild, and it will at least stand a fighting chance of survival, but not sheep. (laughs) Sheep are so defenseless, they are totally dependent on a shepherd to protect them. They are. You know, you put any other animal back in nature after it's been domesticated, um, it it, it may survive, might not, but it it may. It's at least got a fighting chance. You put a sheep back in the wild after being domesticated, um, you just gave nature a snack. (laughs) Without a shepherd, the sheep can't survive for very long. Sheep are quite dumb. Well, that's another word Beverly tells me not to say in the pulpit. Sheep are quite dumb. And guess what we are compared to in Scripture? We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. It's not a compliment. 
But if the sheep will stay within the boundaries imposed by the shepherd, (laughs) they will be protected and they will flourish. So if the shepherd says, no, you can't go over there, or no, you can't eat that grass over there on the edge of that cliff, he's saying no for their own good. Brothers and sisters, there is a prayer that you can pray that will make you a spiritual survivor. It's very simple, but it's very powerful. If you pray it consistently, it will defend you against the enemy's attacks. It will direct you in the Lord's paths. It will help you with your decisions. It will keep your flesh in check so you don't make dumb mistakes. It will guard you from the danger of temptation, and it will deliver you out of the snares of the devil. It's one little big word. Somebody shout, no. See, just like you pray yes to God's kingdom and yes to God's will, you need to look at the devil square in the eyes and pray no to his kingdom and no to his will. My goodness. Apostolic believers, when we pray, we are equipped to do more than just entreat. Entreat is a word that that means asking. And it almost has the sense of pleading or begging. And we are equipped, and there are times in prayer we get very insistent. It's intercession, and we are entreating God. We're asking Him. But you are equipped to do more than entreat God. You are equipped to enforce. Listen to me very carefully. Prayer is not about begging and pleading. Prayer in the Scripture is about binding and loosing. That's what prayer is about. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 19, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What are you saying, Jesus? I'm saying that my church has been empowered by my victory on the cross to pray in ways that stop the strategies of hell dead in its tracks. It is your business as a believer to intervene in any situation where the devil is attacking and see that's not the will of God that's the will of the devil so I'm going to stand here as a believer and I'm going to use what God put in me I'm going to say yes to the kingdom of God and I'm going to say no to the kingdom of the devil I'm going to pray yes to the will of God and no to the will of the devil you see when you bind something in prayer you're saying no And when you lose something in prayer, you're saying yes. It's not rocket surgery. (laughs) You say, you mean I'm supposed to make things happen? No, you couldn't make those things happen. But when you pray, God uses you to release those things to happen. It's God's power. It's God's timing. But it's coupled with our prayer. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not earthly or fleshly, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. They cast down imaginations. They cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. They bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So how do you pull down strongholds? You do it by saying and praying, no. No, I am not going to let my child be lost. My boy is not going to be a drug addict. My girl is not going to be an alcoholic. My grandchildren, no, 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 no. I refuse. So I'm going to bind the kingdom of the devil, and I'm going to loose the kingdom of God. I'm going to pray no to the darkness and yes to the light, and I'm going to keep flipping that switch of God's light and God's power until I see it happen in my life and in my family. And by the way, you know, pastor, every once in a while, you know, he really inconveniences all of us and he calls the church to prayer and, yeah. Hmm. You know what fasting is? Fasting is using your body as an exclamation point at the end of your prayer to say, no, I really mean business, God. I really mean business. That's that's why pastor calls us to fasting. Fasting is bringing your physical body in line with your prayer that's saying yes to God and no to the flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so, so I need to finish because, I mean, I could stay all night. Um, Somebody say help. 
simple prayer. Someone say thanks. thanks. Somebody shout yes. yes. Mm, I love that prayer. Somebody say enough. enough. Somebody say the one prayer that's tied to what you do with others. Somebody say sorry. Somebody say no. no. That's an important prayer. Oh, and there's one more, and, and we'll close here tonight. Um, what a joy it has been to teach you this weekend. I, I love your, your, I love your love for the Word of God. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, the last phrase of the Lord's Prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And strangely enough, I want to take the final I am statement of Jesus and twin it here. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, though the worst case scenario has unfolded, Yet shall he live. Now this is kind of cool. Uh, the W sound, the W sound, is actually one of the easiest sounds for humans to make. Babies are able to make W sounds woo, 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 before almost any other consonant. Sounds like T, 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 t or S, s, they require much more fine tongue articulation. But you don't even need a tongue to make a W sound. You just round your lips and go, woo. Try it. Mm, yeah. That's why it's so easy to say wood word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so because that's a natural kind of thing. Is it late? Uh, at home, if I say something crazy, that I just say jet lag, and they all go, mm-hmm. So the W sound is one of the most common sounds across all languages because it's the easiest consonant sound to make. Another study of various languages across all kinds of people and cultures showed that people tend to use similar vowel sounds when they're disgusted or fearful or in pain. And these sounds aren't just random, they're actually quite universal. So if all human beings across multiple cultures and languages and continents, if we all make very, very similar natural exclamations when we're in pain or fearful or disgusted, then how in the world are those natural exclamations decided? Well, they're decided by what your face is doing and where your tongue is in your mouth at that moment. So when you're disgusted, your mouth stays mostly closed and your tongue tenses up and you go, ooh. But when you are in awe of something, your mouth naturally opens and relaxes and your tongue relaxes and you go, oh, it's pretty simple. A feeling of awe naturally causes your face to make an O shape. And if you happen to be making a sound when that happens at that moment, it naturally sounds like a W. And that's why the original use of the word Wow, it probably wasn't a word at all. It was just the instinctive sound that human beings across cultures and languages use when they are in awe of something. Every language has a word for wow. And many of them are very, very similar. And that's not surprising when you think of where that sound came from. And brothers and sisters, in conclusion, I think wow qualifies as a prayer. Every once in a while when you're serving Jesus and coming to church and enjoying the goodness of God and in the middle of a worship service and we're singing some beautiful song and lifting our hands, every once in a while your soul just has to say, wow. You look through a telescope, you can't help but say, wow. Now I know you might feel like on a Sunday night you're just sitting in church listening to me, but that is a total illusion. Because right now, while you're seated in that nice soft seat, the earth is spinning around its axis at a speed of 1,000 miles an hour. So every 24 hours, our planet pulls off a celestial 360. And at the same time, we are also hurtling through space at an average velocity of 67,108 miles an hour. That is 87 times faster than the speed of sound. So on every day when you feel like I really didn't get much done, don't forget that you did travel 1,599,793 miles through space. 
And to top it off, the Milky Way is spinning like a galactic pinwheel at the dizzying rate of 483,000 miles an hour. So no wonder you're tired. When you look through a telescope at the heavens, at the stars, when you walk in a park and you look at a sunset, when you walk down the street in your neighborhood and look at a sunrise, sometimes you just got to back up as a child of God and look at your creator and say, wow. It's not hard to pray a prayer like that. Wow, Jesus. But if you turn it around and you look through a microscope, you can't help but say, wow, either. Trillions of chemical reactions are taking place in your body every second of every day. Right now you are inhaling oxygen and metabolizing energy. You are manufacturing hormones and maintaining equilibrium. You're fighting antigens right now and filtering stimuli. Right now your body is mending tissue and purifying toxins and digesting lunch and circulating blood. And all the while your magnificent brain is performing up to 10 quadrillion calculations per second using only 10 watts of power. A computer would require a gigawatt of power produced by a nuclear power plant to pull off the same performance as your brain is doing right now. If we took your personal genome sequence and we wrote it out longhand, it would be a three billion word book. The King James Version of the Holy Scriptures has 783,137 words. So your genetic code, just you, is the equivalent of nearly 4,000 Bibles. And if your personal genome sequence were turned into an audio book and we played that book at the rate of one double helix per second, it would take nearly a century of constant listening just to put you into words. So you are an amazing creation. You were knit together, formed in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by a God who loves you. And every once in a while, you just got to... <laughs> Music, come on back. We'll, we'll sing and pray in a minute. I know there are some people who say, I have never experienced a miracle. Nothing could be further from the truth. You have never not experienced a miracle. You are a walking, talking, breathing, living, worshiping, praying miracle. Every second of every day of your life. The world you live in is a miracle. Your precious family is a miracle given to you by God. Your children are miracles. But you aren't just surrounded by miracles. You are a miracle. Now, there are lots of wows around us everywhere we look. Human history, American history is filled with wow moments. God's great story of redemption is one magnificent big wow. And if you think about it for a moment, who? Your life is filled with wow moments. Your spouse, your family, your kids, and your grandkids, your friends and your church and your personal journey of faith. So many blessings, brothers and sisters. And sometimes you just got to say, wow, Jesus, you have been so good to me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. So with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Wow, God. Wow, Wow, Jesus. Look at the church I get to go to heaven in. Look at the church I get to serve God in. Look at my brothers and sisters. I know some of their testimonies. I know where some of them came from. I know where I came from. Wow, Jesus. Stay standing. Last scripture. But the greatest wow of your existence hasn't happened yet. Because the most amazing moment of your life... (laughs) 
will be the first moment after your life on earth is over. Whether you die and go to heaven by way of the grave or whether you go by way of the rapture, the greatest, whoo, the greatest wow you have ever uttered will be the moment you see Jesus face to face. Wow. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If he can break you out of the grave and resurrect your body on rapture day, if he can take your physical earthly body so that one steps on Main Street and the next steps in the air and the third steps on streets of gold, if he can do that, don't you think he can deal with whatever problem you might happen to be facing tonight? Paul wrote these words. He said, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The greatest enemy, the most fearful enemy, the very last enemy that humans ever deal with is the enemy of death. Do you understand that Jesus beat your worst enemy 2,000 years ago? It's all downhill from there. He can handle anything that's bothering you. He conquered death itself. He conquered every attack of the enemy. He conquered hell and the devil when he rose from the grave to which I say wow would you lift up your hands would you let your voice ascend like incense before his throne and just give him worship just give him thanks just give him praise and honor and glory what a beautiful weekend we've had I just want to say wow What a great church this is. I just want to say, wow. How good God's been to us. There's testimony after testimony after testimony right in your church family. Wow, Jesus. Would you reach to either side and take your friends, your family members, take them by the hand and lift your hands together like a big choir of uplifted hands across this room. Your hands are important. Lift your hands, clap your hands. So important, but that's not the center of spiritual warfare in your life. Your mouth, your tongue, your words, your vocabulary, your praise, your worship, that's what's important. Would you lift up prayer? Would you lift up prayer? I don't care which prayer you pray. It's all pretty simple. Pray, help, God. I need your help. Pray, thank you, Jesus. Pray, wow, God. Pray, I'm sorry, God. Pray, Jesus, you're enough. Pray whatever you want to pray, but pray something to him. He's so worthy. He's so good. Yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. Oh, I love you, Jesus. It's beautiful, folks. The presence of the Lord is so strong in this room right now. You're in God's great radiation room. Cancer could be burned out of your body right now while you're worshiping Jesus. You're in the deliverance territory of the Almighty. He could work a miracle on your behalf at home while you're here worshiping Him. That's how powerful He is. Keep praying, keep praying. Let's sing. Just keep praying. Let them sing. You pray. 